So, let's go. Let's do it. Um, what okay. would you like to know, Neil? <laughs> let's start at the beginning. Okay. Um, as you were going through high school, did you dream of being a TV producer, a famous actress? I don't, I don't think anybody really dreams of being a producer necessarily because it's such a uh, behind the scenes, strange, all encompassing role really. And I think when you're 15 and you're sort of in your high school play and trying to get the main part, the last thing you'd want to be doing is uh, contracts for all the rest of your fellow cast and things like so that. So what did you dream about as a teenager? Um, well, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be an actress. That was my main, main ambition. I think probably a few people around this room would, came from a performance background rather than necessarily behind the scenes. Um, I think that was the passion that drove me definitely to the industry. Uh, but it became quite apparent quite quickly that I had neither the technical skill <laughs> nor the um, confidence needed really to be on the stage. I think you've really got to have a very particular kind of driven, um, you know, slightly hard shell in order to really do that and put yourself out there. And I think as I went through and kind of experienced more professional aspects of acting, um, I just realised I just didn't have the heart for it. I think you've got to okay. be very brave. So when did you realise that when you were? At I think university? it sort of happened. No, well, it kind of started to happen when I was at Sixth Form College because you know you sort of go through that awkward phase and you're 17 and you're, you know, sort of. I think walking down the corridor is shameful enough, <laughs> let alone getting on a stage in front of lots of people and performing cabaret to your parents and school counsellors. So um, I kind of started realising then that. I had, I was much more interested in the machine that was going on behind the scenes and I think in the sort of, the kind of whole of a production. Um, there's something quite unique in the chemistry of what makes up a production, whether it's stage or film or television, that um, really started to appeal to me at that age. So that's when I sort of decided to so take went, a back seat. you went to Royal Holloway to study drama? I did, yes. And how useful was that degree in terms of your future kind it, of career? It was really useful. I think I applied to quite a few places when I was going through the whole UCAS system. And it was, a, I, think, I think choosing a media or an arts degree at the time that I was choosing it was quite a difficult decision to make because, I mean, jobs in arts and, and media are hard to come by and hard, and not, I don't think anyone necessarily in, I'm speaking purely from my experience in a state school system necessarily prepares you for how hard that will be or gives you much of a kind of background in the vocation of it really. So choosing drama was a bit of a punt because I knew it was all that I really wanted to do and all I really enjoyed. But I, there was a high likelihood that I would be unemployed at the end of three years. So you were um, still at that point, you were chasing your dream, right? To totally chasing my dream, Neil, but with an eye on kind of how difficult that might be. Okay, so, so you graduated when? 2007. Year. And you came out, how did you go about finding work when you graduated? So I think, so the, the course was really helpful, um, that we had incredible, the reason, the whole reason I chose it really was because it had a dramaturgical bent to it, which is what I really wanted to do, I wanted to be around scripts. So um, the teachers were really helpful at Royal Holloway, um, they would do things such as this, such as what Neil is doing and get people in to talk to you. Um, and I talked to my playwriting tutor, uh, who's a very talented playwright and um, uh, academic called Dan Rebellato, who sort of helped me to not meet the right people, but to go in the right direction, I think, um, if I wanted to be in production, in theatre, in London, and able to survive and pay my rent. Um, and so after that, after I left university, in a sort of blind panic of being, <laughs> not really a blind panic, but knowing that there was lots of other people kind of in the mill and everyone wanted to kind of get into that world. I just absolutely scattergunned it and I just blanket emailed every theatre I'd ever, you know, been to, been interested in any, pro in any producing house such as the Young Vic or the National and then independent producers as well. I did a bit of research around the kind of work that they were doing that I was interested in and the one I ended up going to was, um, who ended up accepting me, I should say, they were very, you know, they had me, which was nice. Um, Sonia Friedman Productions was the one I ended up interning at. And that is... That is this lovely bunch of people. Sonia Friedman right here in the middle, right? The yeah. The blonde lady? Yes, that's, with, that's her. With you over her right shoulder? Yes, looking in the background, always in the background. But well, this was a few years later, right? <laughs> that's a few on. years later, that's when I actually worked there. Okay, so you apply to various places, Sonia Friedman Productions, offers you an internship. They did. What they does did. that involve? So an internship, 
um, at that particular period of time in 2007 was an unpaid position and you would do a minimum of about three months um, and you would do everything. So at the time, their office actually still is, is above the Duke of York Theatre in London. And so they, they were putting on, I mean, they had three shows on Broadway at the time, six in the West End and, and a relatively small team running all of that. So um, I, as an intern, I did everything from getting there first in the morning to opening up the office to doing tea rounds for everyone for remembering exactly the way that they liked their tea. I think one of the things I did very early on is I put a filing cabinet together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, you know, decorated the office and did every kind of admin errand I was told to do. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was amazing for that though, because you just, even though you're making tea and taking it into a marketing meeting, you're meeting some of the most important people and the main players that make the industry that you love and have grown up with work and run. So and at that great. point, are you thinking about networking or are you just getting through every day as it comes? I would say the most important thing is to know that once you've been given an opportunity like that, it's up to you to make the best of it, I think is the best way of probably putting that. Because I think networking sort of, I, I think you, it falls under the umbrella of networking. But I think if you really believe and are passionate in what you do and in the work that, that the people that you're working for do, you'll, be, you'll want to be interested and you'll want to go in that room and you'll want to kind of push yourself forward whilst also being very aware that you're there to serve a particular purpose and to help them all do their jobs. So it was really more a case of being Working, working as hard as you can, always making sure that you were there at first, you left last, you were, made yourself indispensable to those people. Um, so then you could have those quiet moments where they're in the middle of doing a theatre contract and you go, would you mind ask if you just let me know what a, uh, you know, a breakdown of a budget means or something like that, you know, little things like so that. So being nosy and being inquisitive is very being important. Being inquisitive but being sensitive and I, Weirdly, it's not really necessary. In the long run, it's putting yourself first, but in the short term, every day, putting their needs above yours, I would say. So how long did the inter internship last? So I was there for three months, um, and that was definitely about as long as I think you can exist in London without being Sorry, paid, I yeah. mean, overdraft. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, what did you do immediately after that? Then? So um, they, were very, they were very good to me there, um, and they had offered me a position in production which was just sort of set dressing and that sort of thing to kind of help pay my way while I worked in the office but by that point I you know had I needed a job that was going to pay me regularly um, and they were all in a marketing meeting one day and one of the heads of press from an independent uh, PR company who works with lots of producers in the West End said that they were looking for an assistant and they were very, very kindly, um, Pam, who's the head of production there, uh, said, oh, I've got this great girl who's working in our office. You should definitely uh, interview her. We, we think she's brilliant. So um, that's when I interviewed at Public Eye for a PR position at, uh, the, in their theatre department. OK, and for those of us who don't know what Public Eye is? Um, so lots of people won't know what Public Eye is, I think, because they're, um, they're quite good at flying under the radar because they're a big PR company and that's what they do. Um, they are a... Uh, PR company based in Chelsea and London that do mainly um, British actors. So I think they've got people like Ben Whishaw and Sienna Miller and those sorts of people and Rob Brydon on their books. And they also did, at the time that I joined them, they did West End Theatre publicity representation and um, things like, I think they've started doing books now. But basically it's all sort of PR and communications. So it's um, running press campaigns for famous actors, running press campaigns for big films, running press campaigns for theatre productions. So, what, were, what was your role or roles at Public Eye? So, the I went in there first as a publicity assistant. And so that person's at the very bottom of the ladder and you do, um, you, you, wait, you, know, you go in early. Again, lots of early starts when you're first starting out. Um, and you scan all of the newspapers. So, you have on your desk, every single daily newspaper from across the country that has run, as well as all of the Google alerts on your client, on your computer. And you go through absolutely every single one and you pull anything that's on any client throughout the company, any press piece that's run. So everyone is always by seven o'clock in the morning 
everyone knows what's happened, what's run, what you know. What are you looking for there? Um, so you're looking for anything that's editorial, really. So a PR company is purely they are in control of um, well, not in control because no one's really ever in control, but they're um, they manage editorial content for their clients. So that means, for example, say if. Um, Daniel Craig is doing the new Bond. His publicist will be the person that um, pitches out for uh, to Longleaf magazines like Esquire, GQ, for him to do a major interview. Um, or if you're the publicist for the movie of Bond, you'll be the one that um, sets a whole campaign months and months, possibly years in advance. You do those big things for Empire where you invite the publicists, the journalists onto set, and then you manage it during release. So, so in some ways you're managing their public celebrity, their persona. That's exact, exactly it. In a nutshell, that is exactly what How did your internship um, with Sonia prepare you for this kind of step up? Well, I mean, it was, I think it was quite, quite like anything really. You, any job, any kind of career, you kind of go in sort of through the side really, which is that um, I'd been around press nights, worked press nights with her and done you know, lots of stuff publicity-wise, been involved in publicity meetings um, while I was there. So going from that to doing the West End, you know, PR kind of campaign stuff wasn't a huge jump. And I think because I went in at the very low level, it wasn't a big responsibility jump. It just, it prepared me because you work very hard, you work very long hours, you're, you've got to have a good attention to detail and you've got to be... I think constantly available and helpful and very organised as the other. And these are your proving grounds, right, for later on? Definitely, definitely. So you set up a comedy department. Yes, so... Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yes, yeah, so it was kind of, I think... Uh, so what happened? Oh, yes. Um, the, <laughs> the publicists um, who worked in the theatre department uh, sort of started shifting around and there wasn't a huge amount of... Um, money really coming in from from that particular aspect anymore because PR is completely client based and so if you pitch and you don't get a client then you've got a, a income stream that's running out and so they gradually started winding down the theatre department and one of the head publicists had left to set up on her own anyway um, and I at the time had I'd always been very passionate about TV and about comedy and so a colleague and I decided to after about 18 months of being there to set up our own sort of separate division which was a um, where we would do TV and comedians personal publicity. And how did that work practically speaking? How did you set that up? Were you given funds by the company itself? Well it's you're quite sort of I mean because it's agency work you're quite free to do that it's quite nice if you're under the umbrella of a big agency like that you you can set up a department if you've got clients. So it's as simple as going to, you know, find you know a couple of TV comedy contacts that you've made and say, listen, we think you could really use this press push on your next show. Um, can we handle it for you? And then they pay you a fee to do that, and therefore, you know, boom, you've got a comedy department. And at that point, I believe you started to meet some famous people. I did start to meet some famous people, Neil. <laughs> um, but it's sort of you kind of I think you do sort of brush shoulders with famous people all the time anyway as soon as you kind of get into that industry you're sort of you know I, I remember at Sonia's even when I was interning it was like she said take this bottle of Sansa to Harold Pinter and I was like <laughs> and so tell me about that because Harold Pinter is one of my heroes oh I mean he was big time my hero I mean I remember reading the dumb waiter when I was 12 and just thinking it was like the best thing and and, and sort of getting into theatre that way was he was a huge part of that and so when when um, Sonia was like, take him this, I was sort of <laughs> trotted on down to the Trafalgar Studios and knocked on his dressing room door. This is when he was... He must have been quite elderly at that point. He was, because he died about 18 months later, but this was one of his final shows um, that Sonia had done at the Trafalgar Studios. This is when I was interning for her. I sort of knocked on the dressing room door in this kind of commanding voice and said, oh, come in. And I opened the door and there he, there great, he was. He had a great voice. Hey, fantastic. I mean, spine-chillingly brilliant. But, um, yeah, it was, that was quite amazing. I sort of popped it on his desk and we had a little chat and then I ran off and sort of had a kind of panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so... Um, so you met Pinter? Who else did you meet? So I met Pinter. So then I guess as you're... Once you... Uh, actually, that sort of comes back to your question about how the internship with Sonia prepared me for my first job at Public Eye because because you're sort of around quite very high profile people a lot of the time because you're the one, in Sonia's case, who's, who's generating those projects that they're all involved in. Um, with PR, they're your clients. 
So you can't be, I think it sounds quite basic to say, we can't be scared in front of them <laughs> because you're the one that's managing their press, their editorials. So quite quickly, you become used to just being around very high profile people. And um, in fact, if anything, it sort of energizes you and galvanizes you to be better at your job because you start getting creative with your job. Because so who are the other people that you met that we uh, would have heard so of? Who would, so our clients, when, we did, when, we would, when I was doing comedy um, representation, we did Armstrong and Miller. Miranda Hart was our client. Rob Bryden was our client. And um, Rob was doing one of the things I did. I love that, the first name terms, Rob. <laughs> well, I don't, probably not anymore, but at the time. Um, but he, uh, what, it, it was the, during the first season of The Trip, which I don't know if anybody knows or likes or is a fan of. Um, I was also a huge Alan Partridge fan when I was at university and I basically spent my freshers week in my room watching both <laughs> series back to back. That's uh, how sad I am. Um, and so when we got to do the trip, I think the most starstruck I've ever been was when I had to take, when I was taking Rob Brydon and Steve Coogan for one of their early junkets. And we did, um, it was when the BBC was back in Shepherd's Bush at the Donut. And we took them there and did BBC Breakfast. And um, I think we did Children in Need. So we, well. you were just managing them, right? Going yeah, into so the studio. And it's, I mean, I would say, P PR is quite, it, it's a very high pressure job. Um, publicists work incredibly hard and it can sometimes be a little thankless, as glamorous as it sometimes might seem for those people who are stood in black behind celebrities on red carpets. It's very, very high pressure, it's relentless because you're not only are you in control of shaping these people's um, campaigns to make sure that you're driving viewers to whatever project they're doing or you're also running damage control a lot of the time with celebrities in particular. So, you know, publicists have to intervene and, you know, do all those sorts of kind of managing of, of journalists in ways like that. And that never really appealed to me. I wasn't very good at that particular aspect of things. But So you all know who Steve Coogan is, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, sorry, so I'm So Steve Coogan has a certain um, reputation. Like oh, yes. Well, we, I wasn't his, I wasn't his publicist. So um, I was purely Rob. So I didn't know much about Steve. I'd never met him before. He was just one of the funniest, most brilliant, smartest guys I've met. Really, really yeah, lovely Even in girl. the back of a car, just like. <laughs> Absolutely. Making like, jokes. Making jokes. Him, him and Rob's relationship was very, um, I think, because I was a big fan of the show their relationship was very much as it is in the trip. I mean, obviously they're playing heightened versions of themselves, but they are just funny all the time. And I think that's always quite nice and encouraging to sort of be around people that are creative and brilliant and nice. And that's what they were. And so that day with them was quite interesting. There was a, there was a radio interview that didn't quite go according to plan at the end of that day. And that's when being a publicist isn't fun because then you have to talk to people and kind of work out what you're going to do. But that was Is that it worth was telling fine. that story? No, Can it's definitely not. Oh, it's really not worth it. It was just, you know, I think that there was a, a, a couple of questions that were more about personal lives than about the TV show. And that is going to annoy anyone who's, who's, wor who's worked hard on a show and wants to promote it and, and be funny. And it's, you know, I think those kind of aspects of being a publicist are incredibly difficult. You have to be very careful about the outlets that you choose, for example, who you put in front of certain things. Um, and then kind of if those things do sometimes go awry, which sometimes they do, um, you've got to be able to cope. Yeah. And you've got to be able to, you know, sort of be, you know, you're not a political spin doctor, you're a celebrity publicist. So you've got to make sure that you're, um, you're not damaging viewing figures for your client, but also everyone's still friends at the end of the day. I know that sounds like a ridiculously, you know, sort of soft thing to say, but you've got relationships with journalists and with journalists that you trust. And if they overstep a mark, then you've got to make sure that you're able to step in and say, that wasn't okay. okay. And so, yeah, so you've come out of university, you've become an intern, you've made the tea, all that kind of stuff. You've moved yeah. on to this new role where you've set up your own kind of department within a larger yeah. company. Um, you then go back to work with Sonia. Yes. Well, that was my decision in that particular it, it, was a hard, it was a really hard decision to make. Can you explain first who Sonia is and her stature within the kind of world of entertainment? Y yes, I can. Um, so I don't know if anybody, well, you probably won't know her name, which means she's a great producer, because I think the best producers probably stand back from their productions. Um, but she's produced, while I was with her, she did uh, Jerusalem with Mark Rylance. She did the Book of Mormon. Um, so this is, this is Sonia right here. That's her, in the middle. Um, 
so she did the Harold Pinter season at the Pinter Theatre. She uh, did Sunny Afternoon. She did Legally Blonde, the musical. She did, gosh, she's done so much. Um, but she's generally one of the top kind of. She figures. at the moment is. She she is now. Yeah, she's just about to do Harry Potter, so she is definitely the top of the pile. Okay, so <laughs> we're we're going to hear a lot about that presumably. Yes. yes. So you go back and work for her. How did that come about? Did she call you and say, Sarah, this place is falling apart without you? <laughs> Amazing if she did. I need someone did. to make my tea. Um, get me a latte would be more appropriate. No, <laughs> she, um, so her head, her general manager, who is Diane Benjamin, who is tucked behind that person there just underneath my chin, um, she called me one day and I had... How old are you at this point? 24? I'm 24. And I had sort of, yeah, 24, I think, yeah. And I had kind of, I think, run my, done my time with PR. I'd really enjoyed it. There's lots of fun things that you get to hang out with Rob Bride and Steve Coogan for a day. But it kind of had got to a point where I didn't enjoy certain elements of that role. A lot of them being the Daily Mail has run this and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, panic stations. Um, and I felt also I really wanted to be back in the kind of creative hub of it. I wanted to be around scripts. I wanted to be in physical production and I missed that element of it. So she, it was sort so of happy. So what was the job that they kind of presented well, to Well, she called me and she said that Lucy, who's also up there, um, who was her assistant at the time and kind of running the company um, on a sort of day-to-day -day office level was about to leave to go traveling and they remembered me from my internship three years before I think and they wanted me to come back and so I was really flattered obviously and um, looking for a new direction so I accepted yeah and went and did that. Okay so tell me about the role then because um, so the there's an upward curve here right? So the idea was <laughs> That I would do, that I would, because I had kind of, I could have climbed a ladder in PR and gone further, but this was a sidestep into something that I eventually knew I really wanted to do. And I knew that Sonia's office was a very tough environment because she does very high profile productions and she's the best in the, in the country at what she does. And it would be relentless. And... I was more than happy to take that on board because I knew that you would you would learn the hard way with her and that's probably the best way to learn. So the, the role was very much, um, I was her assistant, so I'd run the office. Her and personal I would, assistant. I was her personal right. assistant. But I always was very careful to say that I was not a PA and she was all, always very good at saying, Sarah's not a PA, she's assistant to me, which means that I was involved with assisting her on her projects as well as in her personal life and her diary and all of that sort of thing. So I so did So let's break that down. Let's okay. talk about the, the management of... Sonia Friedman. Yeah. Can I show the, um, the dog picture? <laughs> yeah, you can show the dog picture. So um, Sonia very famously has this little white dog in the West End that sort of runs around. It's her pet dog. It's called Teddy. Um, and it's a Bichon Frise. And Teddy is, Teddy requires some maintenance, as does her master. Um, so it's quite scary having it looming, <laughs> looming right over me. Um, so Sonia she works incredibly hard, harder than anyone I've ever met. And she is always on the go, um, just as a sort of slice, as an example. Um, when I worked for her, I had two Blackberries because it was constant. So if one broke, the other one could just pick straight up again. Um, and uh, the day to day with working with Sonia is you, because uh, you're working on American time on, on, in New York, as well as London time. So you would be, Doing, you were with her almost wherever she went. So if you weren't there physically, you were there kind of digitally. So you're across everything for her, scheduling everything for her, um, running the office as well, making sure that everybody else is happy. You're with her at most of her meetings so that if she misses anything and you're noting it, you're there to take the notes. Um, and you, I also started running the internship programme, which was incredibly useful because it meant that there were things that I could you know, palm off to them to do while I was doing the bigger, the bigger stuff. Um, the dog maintenance, for example, is something that was very dear to my heart because I love, I love Teddy, I do. But um, there were times when I couldn't take her for a walk because I had to schedule a conference call with Kathleen Kennedy in the US or something like that. So, um, so let's, let's, I'm going to show the, the Christmas card. Yes, I think you should show it. Because I want to talk about the kind of banal day-to-day -day stuff 
but that opens the door for working on the bigger stuff. Completely. Stuff. So, so can you just talk about this? Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> so anyone with a keen eye and a passion for Shakespeare will know that that is a quote from Twelfth Night, I believe. Um, and it was while we were doing the Richard III Twelfth Night Mark Rylance season at... Uh, the com not the comedy theatre, it was the Apollo Theatre. And uh, every, year for, every year for the Christmas card, Teddy would be in the company Christmas card. So one of my responsibilities was to make sure that <laughs> Teddy was, had the photo shoot done, that everyone had copy approval, <laughs> that everyone was in there, that the quote was right. And so this particular year, we dressed her up as a Tudor and we put her on the <laughs> stage of the Apollo and we had the, cost the wardrobe mistress on that particular production looked like she was about to kill me because it was all authentic Elizabethan stuff that we put her in and we had like candles everywhere and we got it in the shot between shows between the matinee and evening performance and then that went out to 700 contacts in the West End. Um, so that's actually really important stuff. That's it's going very on. important stuff because it's those sorts of things that I think as an assistant um, you are the front line, really, for uh, her reputation to everybody else in the wider well, also world. Also, your name starts getting associated with that stuff. Too. Yeah, you're, absolutely. You're Sonia's assistant. You're Sonia's assistant, and there's a certain... Um, and once you've got your feet under the desk and you've kind of proven yourself, which is something that I think if you any of you are, uh, you know, eventually become assistants in higher media companies or anything like that, you really do have a period of time where you do have to prove yourself because these people have all proven themselves and so they don't really give you much let up in that. But it's a very rewarding experience once you are there, you kind of, um, you know, you're the trust of the company and you have to be in charge of things like this, which is, uh, I know it seems silly, but it's really important. Um, and So that that is kind of the... the that's a level up from the making the coffee, right? Because now you have interns yourself. Totally. So you're the level up. Yes, you're definitely the level up from making. So you're doing stuff like this, but you're also getting involved with big productions, right? Yes. And you're meeting famous people. You, yes, you do. And so you start to. You learn how the production process works. Exactly. That's so can the we most. So talk a little bit about the Book of Mormon. I could talk about the Book of Mormon, yeah. And going um, to New York and. Yes. <laughs> All of that stuff. Um, it, yes, the Book of Mormon was uh, sort of came along while I was working with Sonia, and I'd been her assistant for about two years, I think, when that came along. And I probably already mentioned this, but while you are Sonia's assistant, because you're in all the meetings, because you're taking all the notes, and because you're, you know, facilitating her admin day to day, you basically get a pretty comprehensive understanding of every element of her job without the detail of exactly what it involves. So you couldn't do a theatre contract, for example, but you would know when it needs to happen and by when. Um, so by the time the Book of Mormon came along, I had worked there for a while and um, we uh, sort of just fell into this rhythm of working. I was looking after a lot of the big American um, producers that would come over because obviously it was a huge Broadway phenomenon that we were trying to make work in the West End and I don't know if, if anyone has a passion for theatre they'll probably know that the West End does have a very different model than Broadway in terms of the way that its successes happen um, and I think the sort of there was, there was really a bit of a it was kind of a punt even though it was a huge success in, in broad, on Broadway bringing it to the West End was a bit of a jump. And so I was in charge of looking after everyone and kind of making that process a bit easier. I'm ignorant to this. the stuff. So can you, how is it different, Broadway to the West End? Um, Just real brief. So very, very briefly, uh, for example, um, Press Night on Broadway, there is only one critic that matters and that's Ben Brantley from the New York Times. He can make or break a show with his review. And, but over in this country, we've got, between seven and twelve, the broadsheets, you know, your sort of um, Billingtons and those sorts of people. And they they have a lot of power, but they have huge differing opinions on things. And I think uh, it was interesting because I, it's difficult when something's been such a huge success on Broadway, there is a latent cynicism in the critics in this country in in kind of... Let's see what you can do. An English superiority, perhaps? I don't, I don't know if you necessarily call it that, but um, I think it was always a kind of a challenge. It would be a challenge to show them that this is a show that's, you know, five stars, New York Times. It, so that was kind of the challenge with everyone. And I think people were a little nervous about whether the demographic of theatre goes over here would 
would translate because in you know on Broadway it was people that would buy tickets for South Park fans, but they were people who um, would also normally go to the theatre. So it was and a brilliant kind of mashup. We didn't know whether that would work. Here. They were South Park fans because they were South Park fans because if unless you unless you might already know, but um, it was uh, Matt and Trey who wrote South Park wrote the Book of Mormon, and it was produced by them and Scott Rudin, and then. Sonny Friedman in London. So it was a little, because obviously we knew that the American audience was definitely there, but in London it was a fear. And I think it's always a fear to go from a big success to a potential. And you're talking about absolutely kind of A list stars here in yeah. the theatre world. Yes, yes, they are top of their game. I mean, right. Book of Mormon is the biggest selling, I think it broke all box office records on Broadway. But I mean, someone like Scott Rudin has had has 30 years of success behind him. Yes. He I produces mean, yeah. top line Hollywood films. Well, he's all the Coen the Brothers producer and he's Wes Anderson's producer. Zoolander. And he's Zoolander. <laughs> and now Toolander as well. Um, so, so, yeah, so I think with London, we were, you know, for Sonia's little team, it was bringing this big behemoth with all of the success to uncharted territory and with, you know, some very high profile people. It was, quite, it was a very, um, electric time so uh, that's sort of how I ended up working with those people. So what were you actually doing in New York? I mean I saw you on Facebook oh, you yes. were having a great time. Um, so I went over to I went over to New York to um, I think I was I was there for the uh, opening on Broadway of Book of Mormon and because we were doing Jerusalem at the Music Box Theatre at the time as well um, I was during the London opening for Book of Mormon I was basically locked to London um, and I went over afterwards for a trip with Sonia to, uh, I think we would, she was doing marketing meetings and, and subsequent stuff over there, so I was assisting her over there. Um, and you met Rudin? Yes, I've met him uh -huh. a few times. Um, Did you meet um, the South Park boys? Met them, yes. Uh -huh. They are, um, but they, you know, they were, they were creative, so they were, you know, in to make sure that the show was up and running and give their notes and then had to go back to the sort of the next kind of South Park schedule because their South Park schedule is pretty brutal. Oh, right. um, but yes, I met them all. They were all wonderful people, but intimidating in their kind of genius. I think. Did you do any partying over there? Or? Did I do any partying in, in New York? Not with Matt and Trey. <laughs> I don't think they party. Um, I did do some partying in New York, but uh, it wasn't with Scott Rudin. <laughs> Well, um, the audience might want to ask you about that. Um, I want to press on mm -hmm. to the final part and ask you about um, leaving Sonia and becoming a producer on your own two feet. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so I think after. Why did you get tired of hanging out with South Park people? I did. Well, it's, uh, the, I mean, I was you never hanging out with them, and I was just. I think I'd done my time as a. I'd done my time as an assistant, and um, it was you know wonderful being an assistant. But I was ready to jump up to the next level, and I was very fortunate that I'd managed to work on such an amazing production as Mormon. And I think after I'd done that, I sort of felt that there were. Um, I wanted to be kind of back in the comedy world again and uh, I was lucky enough um, for a, a very good friend of mine who I'd kept in touch with back in the PR days of comedy, TV comedy, um, was looking, had set up his own company, was a writer and was looking for a development producer. And so even way back then when you were working your ass off, making coffees, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. that link then helped you years later yeah totally. so you never know you never know I think just the best thing to do is to keep in touch with those people that you find interesting and creative because they will chances are they'll find you interesting and creative and as you both you know kind of make your dues I guess pay your dues um, keep in touch because eventually you'll start to generate work together um, and that's what happened with so did you get a call rows. or did you leave and then I got a call I got a call Another from them call. and they um, and we sat down together and talked a bit about the kind of work that they were doing. They had just started, so my bosses are two uh, TV writers called Harry and Jack Williams, who wrote The Missing for BBC One last year, just about to do The Missing Two. Um, and they sat down and they just, they, they were in the middle of writing The Missing and they'd got a Channel 4 comedy pilot away and they needed a development person to come on and help push their slate and meet other writers and produce their work really and I just come off the back of doing this which is a pretty big mark on your CV yeah. so um, then I sort of sat down with them and we got along and they hired me.
<laughs> so you interviewed for it? Yeah. Okay. How did you tell Sonia that you were leaving? Um, it was quite tricky. Um, I sort of told her, I think I picked my, I picked my moment. It's the, always good to pick a moment to know when you're going to leave. And it was after Mormon was over and manageable and had been a big success and all of those things. Um, and so I sort of, I think it was a very difficult decision again, but I... Was it, was it a, was it a risk for you leaving someone so established, going off onto a new company that hadn't definitely, really, definitely. Hadn't really has yeah. any foundation? It was a that. huge risk, huge risk, because um, uh, even though I actually, I knew personally it wasn't a huge risk because I had huge faith in Harry and Jack and they're brilliant, but um, I think, yeah, on the outside, it, you could definitely argue that it was because she had so much coming up. I mean, I knew that we were about to do Harry Potter next. I knew that that was the next thing. And so that was a hard project to yeah. step away from. But, you know, you've got to look at the day-to-day -day of your role. And I was, I had ticked off, I could do it all. And as soon as I knew I could do it all, it was time to try and do something else. Okay. So, break down, you now become a producer in your own right. Break down the role for me. What does being a producer entail? Um, so it's different with TV and with theatre. Um, but it's similar enough. I think the general role is you are the one who is in charge of everything. So um, for, t for TV, for example, you, uh, sometimes you originate the idea. Sometimes a writer will pitch an idea to you um, and you will uh, take that on if you're really passionate about it, develop it with them, with your expertise, knowing what the channels are after, knowing what might be realistic for a basic comedy budget, for example. Um, and then you pitch it to a channel and you hope that they say yes and they commission the script or they commission a pilot. And then the producer is very much in charge of, and this is for theatre and um, TV, you're in charge of the creative development of the project. So um, the writing of it, you'll give script notes often if you're generating it from, from the get-go and not doing you know, a, a pin to play, for example. Um, so you'll be in charge of that aspect of it. Um, you'll be in charge of how, you know, kind of <coughs> delivering the dream of the writer or the tone that you've both agreed on. Um, you're also, you've got to keep an eye on the budget. That's absolutely within your control because as a producer, you manage every aspect of physical production. So everyone is feeding into you all of the time. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're achieving everybody's expectations on budget. And you've also got to make sure you deliver it on time because if you don't, that's a problem. <laughs> so you can't be tardy. Yeah, so you've got to keep um, all of those practical considerations um, in mind, especially when you're doing when you're doing physical production, when you're actually doing it. Can you keep going while I find a, fr a clip from Fried? Um, yep, abs okay, yep, absolutely. Um, so what else do you have to do as a producer? So what else do you have to do as a producer? So a lot of the time it's, uh, it's negotiation. So it's a lot of making sure that everybody is happy. You're the boss, but you're also the person that has to make sure that the ship that you're in charge of keeps floating. And if an actress isn't happy with the way that her wig is sitting on her head and it's uncomfortable and she can't act. I know it sounds prima donna -y, but it affects everybody on the floor because if that person's not happy, then the people around them are just frantic. Your AD team are wasting time trying to make sure that this person is okay um, while you know, you're just hemorrhaging minutes of valuable shooting time. Um, so there's that sort of aspect of it. If you're not in production and you're in development, you have a responsibility to your bosses, to the people that hire you at the production company to make sure that you're constantly bringing in a slate of ideas. You're meeting writers all the time. Agents will pitch writers to you. They will give you um, scripts to read and you have to make sure you read them on time, you feed back. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's an incredibly exciting and fun role to have, but it's one that can be, you know, uh, takes a lot of great organisational skill and kind of being and on it. What are the main TV shows that you've done in recent years since so when I Two Brothers? So when I left Sonia, I produced a pilot that was a non-TX pilot, purely just for the channel uh, to look at, called The Guardians, which Harry and Jack wrote and directed. And that was about that sort of a kick-ass type uh, comedy setup. It was single camera, so modern family mockumentary style about a group of vigilantes in Croydon who dress up as superheroes in the face of the London riots. Um, we did that, and then after that I did the pilot for Fried, 
and then that went to series, and then I did the series last year. Can I show a clip? You can show a clip. I hope this works. I should have set out. this up beforehand. Is that the trailer? Um, the oh, launch yeah. and post-launch trailer. Key ingredients for running a successful business. Fasten your seat belts, everyone. Here comes the morning rush. Knowing and valuing the customer. Yeah, real job. A motivated workforce. You're probably all wondering why I called you here. No, not really. Give and competent management. Remember to smile. You're on toilet duty for the next month. Number ones, twos and threes. What number three? Can we all get them. So, don't we? Can somebody please tell this lot? Fry on BBC Three and BBC Three HD. Um, so, Fried, yes, it was a six-part series for BBC Three uh, that we filmed, we had to film up in Glasgow because uh, it was commissioned under a regional remit for the BBC. Mm. Scottish folk have bad diets, right? <sighs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we just had to play into that stereotype, guys. <laughs> I don't. Um, so, we, uh, so we shot it up in Glasgow, uh, but we cheated uh, Glasgow for Croydon. So, apparently, the two cities look alike. Um, or we made them look alike. Uh, so... So yeah, so we spent um, about six weeks shooting that. Uh, it's you know, it was about a week per episode, but we worked pretty hard because we uh, lost the light at two p.m. in Glasgow during uh, during December. You should have spoken um, to me. I told you. I know. Why didn't we have you on locations, Neil? Um, so yeah, it was uh, the first series I've ever done. I've never done a series for the BBC before um, at, or for TV before. So it was a really great experience. I was very lucky to have a great a wonderful comedy cast um, and it was all in all we we did three months up there so we did prep time and then six weeks shooting and then I did another three months after Christmas in the edit and that the edits just me the director um, and the editor just kind of clipping it all together and going oh that's funny put it there and then the execs go it's not funny what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah so that's fried really okay two final questions mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about variation on a theme Oh, yes. Um, because I, um, I went to that production, it was very oh, good. you did? Oh, thank you for coming. Um, so when I left Sonia's, uh, I kept in touch, again, similar thing as with Harry and Jack, I kept in touch with a colleague there who's, um, who was kind of a producer too, and we decided to set up our own little mini company doing strange little plays that no one had heard of or uh, plays that used that from famous writers that hadn't been done for a while. And so I did... In my spare time, we did variation on a theme, which was at the Finborough Theatre, which is an unknown Rattigan play. I'm not sure if anyone likes Terence Rattigan here, um, but that's who wrote it. And uh, so, yeah, so we did... It was quite... It was a pretty high-pressured time, because I was doing the pilot for Fried at the same time as we were going into previews for variation on a theme. So during the day, I was in prep in Lewisham in a chicken shop, and in the evening... <laughs> I was in the French Riviera in the Finbury, Finsbury Theatre. Um, and so it was a long days, but it and did pretty well. It sold out. And you, <laughs> you crowdfunded that, didn't you? Yes, we did. We kickstarted that. So. Um, and when we were there, um, the woman from Harry Potter, Miriam. Oh, yeah. Miriam Margulies was there. She was in the front yeah. row. Well, because Rachel Sterling, who's Diana Riggs' daughter, was the lead in uh -huh. it. So she played our Rose. Um, and so what we did in terms of. Uh, of investment for that is we did uh, we took a portion of the investment to fund it on Kickstarter because crowdfunding for something like that which has a particular time limit in that you book a theatre and you have a slot so you have to raise the capital before you, you have to pay your actors basically um, giving that over to totally crowdfunding is a really big risk um, because there's no guarantee on those sorts of things that you're going to raise that amount of capital. And we had quite a lot that we needed to raise. So we managed to raise, I think we raised 5K on crowdfunding, but the other 15, because we did it for 20, which is insane now I think about it, um, the other 15 was uh, it, private investment that we raised ourselves by going off as mini theatre producers with an investment package and just sitting down with rich people that owned companies and said, how about this? You know, you get your name in the programme. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, so, so what are you working on now? Final question. So at the moment, we're very much in development. Um, we've got, uh, we've just finished shooting um, a drama for the BBC, a new drama, which is a four-parter, one-hour uh, episodes which the boys have written called One of Us which is set in the Scottish Highlands um, sort of family drama there's a murder at the heart of it so it's all very exciting and dark uh, so we're finishing that uh, we've got Tripped for E4 which is coming out next year and that's um, 
sort of uh, Quantum Leap meets The Misfits. <laughs> <laughs> I think Channel 4 would murder me for saying that to you guys. It's definitely way better than that. Um, and that's uh, about two sort of uh, alternate world sliding hapless heroes. Um, that's very exciting. And then uh, we've got two more thrillers filming next year, which I can't talk about, and another comedy series filming next year, which I can't talk about. But right. it's all sort of going. Will you come back in three years or four I will years? And yep, I will come back and say. Just perch on tables with me again? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Great.